Today we are excited to have Brenda Hirsch Kirchmer, I hope I said that right, Brenda, joining us all the way from Ontario with Campus for Communities. Brenda is a passionate community builder who believes communities get better when their leaders do. She's the founder and CEO of Campus for Communities. She will be speaking to us today on positioning ourselves for future readiness. And now I will turn it over to you, Brenda. Well, hey, thanks, Anita. Hi, it, I, I am so excited to be here. I'm turning my camera on just for one minute just to wave and say hi, and so that you know there's a real person behind, behind this uh, session. So thanks thanks for letting me do that. And I'm so excited to be here. You have no idea. Um, it's some, There's something about Albertans. I've missed you, um, and things aren't quite the same now that I have moved back to Ontario. And so I started to think about that as, as I was preparing for this session. I thought, what is it about Alberta, especially rural Alberta, that made me that makes me feel that 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 way? And um, and I and what came to my mind was a story of, uh, that that actually happened at an RPAP uh, conference. And I had done the opening keynote and and then a couple of other sessions. And at the very end of the conference, this woman came running up, and she, she turn, it turns out she was an elected official. Uh, but she said to me, she said, I, I just have to tell you, I got to tell you. And I thought, oh, oh, I, I guess she really liked this session. I'm hoping that was the case. But she said, you know, she said, you are, you are so normal. And, and I kind of looked at her and I thought, thank you, uh, I, I think. <laughs> So I wasn't sure if it was a compliment or not. And she said, oh, no, no. She goes, it was definitely a compliment. She said, you're just so, so real and, and forthright and practical. And I really appreciate that. And, and then I thought, you know, I guess that's it. That's why I, I love working with Albertans, especially um, people who live in rural communities, you're my people, because I too am real and forthright and practical. And that's really what this session is going to be about. So just, just so that you know, this uh, I do um, put a lot of text on my slides, but that's because I want it to be uh, a resource for you. And so you will be, you will have access to not only the recording, but the, but the slide deck. And I'm also going to run through this um, fairly quickly, but uh, I wanted to ensure that we left time for questions. And Holly and Anita are gonna help me with that. And if you have further questions after that, I just wanna let you know that we have two courses that are starting in February and I'll talk a little bit more um, about that. But before we get started, there's also just one thing I wanted to share with you. And this for me was, has been of critical importance. It came to me the, um, from, from a futurist colleague, colleague in North Carolina, his name is Rick Smyer. And the first time that I talked with him, he said to me, you know, he said, one of the most important things for a leader to learn is not to dismiss something just because you don't understand it or don't have a bucket to put it in. You can tell he was rural too. He used that bucket analogy. He said, so just cause you don't know it, you can't dismiss it. You have to be open to that. And so, you know, in terms of what I'm showing today, I'll, you know, some of it is gonna be familiar to you. Some of it might not be, and some of it might validate what you're already doing intuitively. And so I just, I just think that's so important to remain, to remain open. And so that's what I would just encourage you to do. This is just the description of the, the session. And it's really, I think this is growing. A lot of it is about this growing understanding that, um, that we may not be, uh, we not, may not all be future ready, but we do know that there's, there's this, this, these intrinsic links between health and social and economic and environmental challenges and that we need to be able to deal with it. So that's really what this, this session is about. And most of what we're going to focus on are five key strategies. We're going to set some context for that, but five key strategies. And we're doing this kind of at a, a higher level, and that will allow some time for some questions too. So uh, why future readiness? Why the heck are we talking about future readiness? So there's a lot going on in our communities and our world right now. And my guess is that some of you might be nodding right now because you are dealing with these issues. 
But I think that we're all trying to clarify our future direction. It's a bit fuzzy right now, and a lot of us are spinning. We're dealing with the social determinants of health, the pressing global um, priorities that have been identified in the 17 social development goals, the, the 17 SDGs. We've got disengaged citizens in some cases. We have new economic models. We're seeing pressing need for partnerships and collaborations. Definitely a lot of complex issues that are crossing sectors, as well as, as challenges relating to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So it is a complicated world for sure. And if that is not enough right now, um, we're dealing with mega trends. And you know, no one can really predict these days because we are in essence preparing for a world that hasn't been invented yet. Um, but I wanted to share with you this report. And this, I, interestingly enough, is something that I first read in 2018 when it came out. And it's, it's very clear um, how they were able to predict a lot of what was going to come at us. And this, this actually came from Goldsmith University and it was really a literature review and the result of a number of focus groups. But if you think about this, I think this in a lot of ways does summarize what we're dealing with now. And if you feel overwhelmed, this is probably one of the reasons. So it's social fragmentation and the precariousness that we're, we're dealing with right now um, as a result of you know, the lack of affordable housing and, and poverty and uh, political um, polarization and increasing loneliness and isolation and environmental pressures and the decline of traditional organizations and uh, um, gl global volatility. Who you know, no one would at, in 2018 wasn't looking for a war in in the Ukraine. So all of these major issues are are adding to the complexity and our feeling that that things are pretty overwhelming right now. So I wanted to share that just so that you know that you're not alone. But there is a way to describe this too. Um, historically, we have often referred to times like this as being VUCA. And when you think about it, the term VUCA um, was actually developed during the Cold War. And it was another time when things were um, really un unsettling. Um, VUCA is actually a, a, an acronym for volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. But some futurists now are suggesting the term BANI, uh, which is an acronym for brittle, anxious, non-linear, and incomprehensible. And, and no wonder we're a little bit stressed with the messiness right now. I wanted to share this, this cartoon. Brenna actually gave me permission to use this. And I thought it was great in the way that it summarized kind of where we are right now post COVID. Because I think there are many of us who are saying, you know, uh, we wanna go back to normal. And what Brenna is suggesting here, and I think what, what I'm suggesting is what if we went forward instead? Because the way she's captured normal, when you look at it, it wasn't all that great. Um, when, you, when you see here uh, the number of cars on the road and the, the, the emphasis on the, the mega mall and kids lined up in schools and, and rich people getting richer, you know, versus COVID where so much, you know, so there were so many challenges for so many um, in terms of the lockdowns and the results of COVID. Um, so do we want to go back to, to normal or do we want to go way, to, a way forward? And this is exciting and I think so relevant to, to health and to what, what RPAP is doing in that they're focusing on so many of these issues in terms of, of, of um, food security and getting people more active and building a sense of community and growing our own food. I'm not sure about putting the rich people in jail, but, but, um, but it is a way of thinking about the future differently and why we need to do that. So we need to be positioned for future readiness. It's critical. And I know, I know a lot of people are, you know, are, are, a play, maybe being being a bit of an ostrich and 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 hiding from it. But you know the re reality of not being future ready 
um, is that not doing anything is the far greater risk. Standing still right now is something that none of us can afford to do. So, and it's because the world is just changing at this increasingly um, fast pace, a lot of information, a lot of technological changes. And so that is not going to, that's not going to slow down. Um, but it also means that we, not, we may not be equipped with the skills, the knowledge, and the attitudes that are needed for a different approach. Um, and so it's for us in the work that we've been doing, um, it's become increasingly clear that successful leaders, and by leaders, I'm not necessarily talking about a fancy title, because believe you me, some of the most impactful leaders we have seen um, don't have that title. Um, so it's, it's, a, um, it's about leaders who have mastered the basics of change, how, how to anticipate, anticipate it, how to support it, and how to manage it in this messy environment of ours. Um, and the other, the other reason future readiness is so critical, because if we're going to shape the future toward better and more impactful outcomes, then we need to work together to create the change that we want to see in our communities. And if we don't do that, others will create the change that they deem as being important. So that's a, you know, that's kind of a really important way of thinking about the community. So five strategies, that's stressful. And I just shared a lot about the context that hopefully, hopefully didn't depress you. And because I'm, I'm sure part of this is, I hope part of this is just acknowledging that um, we're, we're stressed right now. It's a stressful time, it's a messy time, but there are strategies. So um, I wanted to kind of set that context, but then also provide you with what we see as five key strategies for being future ready. ready. And the, the first one is really viewing your community of stakeholders as untapped often, not always, but but typically as untapped assets. And I know that typically we tend to think of, of, of assets as being infrastructure or you know, roads and facilities and programs, things that are more tangible. And I think that what is important is that we think about our citizens and our residents and other stakeholders as being untapped assets and the human intelligence that they bring it is absolutely essential for all of us. So the best way to explain this is with this one slide. And I, I it's something that has developed um, over the years to explain this, but part of why we're not able to, to haven't been able to, in a lot of cases, tap the resources of, of, the, of our stakeholders and our citizens is because our traditional delivery service um, has been based on needs. So traditionally, and this isn't anybody's fault, this is the way we've been trained, this is the way that we have actually given up our power to professionals, but it's based on needs. It's what it's what we don't have. You know, I think taxpayers treat this like um, it's almost like a vending machine. They put in their tax dollars and they want the, the services, and if they don't get them, they get ticked off. You know, it's based on this need, and we want services to meet those needs. And what happens is that that means we're, we're treating people in our communities as consumers. And when we do that, um, we end up seeing the answers as being programs and outside experts, so people from outside of our communities. And whether we like it or not, this traditional approach has created this dependency cycle. And that's what we're trying to break. And, and certainly there is a time for this approach. I'm not saying that, that, that um, there isn't a time for this approach, but what we need more of is, is, is a, an approach that really focuses on stakeholder community-led development. And this, um, a lot of this thinking for me was influenced by John McKnight and John Kretzman from the Asset-Based Community Development Institute. Um, but an asset approach is different because instead of viewing communities as a glass of water half empty, we're treating it as a glass of water half full. And it's, it's really thinking about what is there, what, what are our assets, um, what are our connections and the contributions that everyone can, each of us can make. And when we make that shift, 
we're not pushing services out, we're pulling them in. And we're not treating people as consumers, we're treating them as citizens. And inherent within that approach is that people and the community are the answer, not outside experts. You know, people who live in communities, they know what that what's strong, they know what's wrong. And if you ask them, they have some darn good ideas about how to fix it. So this is how the potential for innovation and sustainability and all of these complex issues can be improved. Okay, I can't see anybody's faces, so I'm hoping that you're still with me. So I'll just keep motoring along till we get to the part where we can start to um, hear from you, your comments and your questions. So keep that in mind as we as we move through this. So one of the other things that we, we've learned in terms of engaging others, besides using a community development approach, is simply to think about this in terms of co-creating in, in projects and, and collaboration. And I'm, I'm sure there are some among us here who have been certified by the project as PMIs as from the Project Management Institute. This is an international certification that many people take to become certified as a project manager. And at the core of this learning is that every project or initiative has three components, and they've described this as the project triangle. And what it means in essence is that each project, anything you tackle something new in your community or revisit it in some way, um, we there's three things that we need to look at. Uh, the time and the schedule, every project has time and schedule, every project in some way has a cost. And the third one is that they all have a scope. And so we, we sometimes, I think, especially in the nonprofit sector, don't always think as much as we should about scope, but scope is really critical. And what we have seen in terms of the communities and the initiatives that have been transformative and innovative is that emphasis has been placed early on in terms of engaging stakeholders. And they have been actively involved in co-creating the scope before anything starts. It's very different from our typical approach where we end up with a, an idea or a project, we, end, we solve, you know, a lot of times we solve a problem and then we go out and, and try to engage stakeholders. We need to do that on the basis of an issue, engage people at the very beginning. And that will derail a lot of the, 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 the budding of, it, of the heads that we see with scope creep. We need to really hit that on at the very beginning. Uh, we can leave the time and the schedule to the project team. That makes important. That's that's quite important. Um, and the senior leadership needs to be be really um, aware of the cost. But the scope is something that needs to be co-created. So I'm hoping that that makes sense to you. I'm, I'm envisioning some of you actually nodding. So, so <laughs> what I want to say about future ready leaders is that. I don't know that a future ready leader is going to be able to solve most problems. And so I want you to relax about that because they're too complicated. They're just too complicated. So our job is not necessarily to solve the problem. It is to call the meeting. And that's why community building and, and the kind of work that the, the RPAP community development and engagement team is very much involved with they're involved with community building and supporting others to do that community building. Um, and, and so what it, what it means for us is that we, we don't need to solve it. We just need to design a process that allows all voices to be heard. And if we allow those voices to be heard, it will be a way to engage people and encourage their responsibility for actually implementing that solution. So it means for all of us, and this is this is where unlearning quite often comes in, is that you know we've been trained to as to solve the problems, but we need to let go of that and be comfortable with not knowing the answers in advance. We can have some ideas, but we don't have to have a definitive solution before we call that meeting, which is not usually how we do things. 
um, what it what it means we need to let go of some of the control. We also we also aren't saying just give you know the community carte blanche to make the decisions. We're also saying that there's a there's a coaching role involved, but we more than anything we need to make sure that they have the data that they need to be able to make informed decisions. So it's so that piece is really important. And a lot of times we don't have that data. And that's where digital optimization and data science comes in. But that's probably um, the topic of another of another workshop. So that's the first strategy, engage your stakeholders as untapped assets. The second thing to be future ready is to emphasize collaboration over silos. And I think there's a growing recognition that we have to be silo busters because health is not, is not just health. <laughs> it's not, it's, it, it goes beyond that. And we know that we need to do more collaboration. You're already and have been and are, are, are continuing to make collaboration a priority. What we did learn, and this was, again, was reinforced for me um, by my futurist colleagues um, who, who always talk about the different kinds of change um, in, in that there's change that reforms and there is change that transforms. And for many years and, in, and up to the current time, much of our effort has been focused on change that reforms. And change that reforms, what it does more than anything is encourage more efficiency and more effectiveness. And yes, we need change that reforms. But we also need to do far more than we're doing in terms of change that transforms and turns things upside down and disrupts. And that makes some people uncomfortable for sure, but it is the only way to be future ready. And so one of the things that we attempted to summarize is the different kind of collaboration that we were seeing. And again, a lot of the, these learnings came from the work that we did in Alberta, because sometimes, and again, um, cooperation and tra traditional collaboration are important um, for change that reforms. But if we want to get to change that transforms, it's a lot of times it needs to be about collective impact which is you know, where a lot of us have kind of latched on to collective impact, but there's something more. Collective impact typically only deals with one specific issue. What we learned from rural Alberta, and specifically during, for, um, during the ACE Communities Initiative, which, which I had the honor of directing through, through ARPA, we worked with 60 different communities. And what we saw worked is that we went to the community first and asked them to, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't just the usual suspects. We brought together, uh, we wanted the informed decision making. So we brought government, social profits, businesses, and individual community members together. And we didn't start with the problems. We started with asking them to, to identify their assets. You know, what do you love about your community? And then we, as a community, identified and prioritized what they wanted to focus on. And a lot of times they were building on their existing strengths, but they were also identifying gaps as well. So that's a, that systems collaboration. And so we're talking about systems multi-sector collaboration as being an important strategy. The challenge of this and the opportunity is that finding and implementing solutions is challenging for any one organization or any one sector to do on their own. But we have to do this collaboration within and across um, organizations and sectors. So it means we need to bring together government and nonprofits and the business sector and social enterprises with citizens, which is why that in that graphic, we have citizens um, threaded throughout. The challenge is that it's no one's job, really. We, you know, uh, well, it's some people's job because I'll tell you the the RPAP, um, the team that's focused on community development and um, engagement. That's 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 a big part of what they are doing. They are the collaboration conveners. We need more funding and more support and more learning opportunities for collaboration conveners. They're kind of the neutral players who are supporting those at the local level. 
um, to, to bring together these sectors. You know, it's a very specific role, but it is, it's, um, it's, I think, probably the greatest barrier to the transformative change that we're looking for is that we need someone to take responsibility to bring everyone together, to be, to be neutral. Uh, the, next, the next strategy is be driven by your why. And if you know me, you know I've been talking about this since the late 90s. Um, more people are talking about it now. Stephen Covey used to say, begin with the end in mind. This particular graphic is from a Simon Sinek who did this fabulous TED talk and a book called The Golden Circle. And what he really, the way he explained it is that conventionally, we have worked from the outer blue circle into the why. So typically, we, we, we start with our what we do, how we do it, but we forget to support the why. And what is important is that we not only begin with the why, um, that we do have to do that before we move to the how and why, and how and what. So we move from the inner gold circle out to the blue. That's what inspires people. We have to do that before we move to the what and the how. There's another way of saying this, Bernadette, Bernadette Jewey, I think is her name is pronounced, um, wrote this book about, the, about thinking about this as the fortune cookie. And, and the way she explained it is that we too often promote the cookie or what we do, um, which is, you know, a lot of times what we're promoting, you know, people ask, what do you do? Think about your own job. What do you do? We talk about our programs, our special events, our research, our initiatives, our services, our resources, our facilities. That's not the fortune that we bring. Um, that's, that is the stake for sure, but it's not the sizzle. The sizzle and the fortune are the same thing. Your fortune in health are really the benefits that you deliver for individuals, community, and, and the environment. And I think also a little bit about, the, about economic well-being as well. So that's a, a bit about being driven by your, your why, but it's a very different way of thinking. You know, it's, it, it takes a while. I know it took me a while to start thinking uh, beginning with the why. So now, you know, every time I, uh, I plan a meeting or a learning event or put, do something on my website, some, something that's about marketing, it's always about why am I doing this? And it's like channeling your inner two-year-old. So don't forget to do that. So the fourth strategy is about investing in future-ready leadership. Um, Another futurist colleague of mine, um, Dr. Peter Bishop, um, says that uh, leadership, it's not a title, that leadership is a voluntary position, and that formal leadership is simply authority ship, gives you authority to do more things. Um, so what he's encouraging all of us to do is to think about ourselves as a leader. So yeah, maybe we can change um, we can't change our entire community. Maybe we can't change the province or maybe we can't change the world. But what we can do is change our corner of the world. And that's what we all need to be thinking about. So why, why should you focus on being a future ready learning? Well, it, what, what we are seeing in terms of, I mean, you know, I know a lot of people are looking for more concrete research. We're starting to gather that now. Um, so a lot of this initially was anecdotal, but what we we, we have seen and I'm seeing more of is that future ready leaders have an increased ability to provide responsive, meaningful programs, products, services, and initiatives. There's more potential for innovation with a future ready approach. There's increased credibility, less chance of burnout. Future ready leaders, I think, are probably happier because they know they're doing the right thing and they know they're making a difference. Um, and that comes with having stronger capacity and, and the ability to make a difference. And a lot of that is based on what we've already just talked about. What we also learned, and again, um, this was really amplified in the, the, the work that we did. Um, I, I think ACE communities actually lasted six years. It started as a one-year project, but... Uh, but, but what we were trying to do, especially for our funders, was to measure our impact. In, and what we were trying to do was put the evaluation in the hands of the people actually doing the work. So we were looking for a leadership assessment tool and could not find one. 
Uh, most of them that were out there were designed for businesses. So instead, what we did in every single community meeting, and this started when I was teaching at Niagara College, and then it just kind of um, morphed in amplified in terms of the work that we are doing in, in Alberta and since. And since then, we just really asked people, what do you want to see in your leader? You know, or what are you bringing as a leader that you think is really important? And so we collected a remarkably similar data from communities across the country and landed on eight competencies. Um, each of these competen competencies has indicators that are associated with them. And all of our learning materials are based on being able to deliver these competencies and to show that the participants in our learning have, have increased their capacity for, for delivering on these competencies. So um, that was a, that was a, a huge learning for us, for sure. And I think, I think what became clear is that these are not typical competencies. They're not typically things we've been trained to do. And they're not the, the competencies necessary needed to manage the internal um, organize the internal components of an organization because we we've been trained to do a lot of that. These are competencies for those who are working outside of their communities, um, with outside of their organizations, and are doing work with the broader communities. So. Um, that's about what we see as future ready leadership, thanks to many of you. Um, the fifth strategy is, is getting good with messy. And I know there are some of you who are okay with messy and dare I say actually thrive on messy, but not all of us do. But I hope that it helps you to um, understand that it's not you. We, we are living in increasingly messy, complicated times. Our priorities are shifting. Our leadership is changing from being authoritative and top down to needing to be more shared and distributed. Um, we, we still have a need for top down, but we're seeing more bottom up um, it's, I guess it's a hybrid of bottom up and top down and what I call middle out, because I see these collaboration conveners who are often um, working middle out to connect the top, the, you know, the grass tops to the grass roots. So the middle out people, I think, are becoming increasingly important. I think they work, they work horizontally, they work vertically and sometimes even diagonally. So it means, you know, it means more collaboration within and across the silos. It means this cannot, the solutions are not primarily professional. They need to be co-created with citizens and stakeholders. We can't be reactive. And I know we had to be reactive during COVID. Uh, we had to be reactive. Um, but there's time, the timing now is ripe for being more, thinking more long-term, being more ambitious and more proactive. And yes, that will probably mean we make some mistakes but that is part of the learning curve. Um, so we also need to think not just about what's happening currently, our focus, at least some of our focus has to be about, about the systems and the networks. And I think the last one is really important and I'm, and I'm not sure we're talking about it as much as we should, but I think one of the ways we've prioritized and made decisions about our priorities in the past has been has, has typically been consensus of the majority. And I think what we need to do a better job and we all need to take responsibility for this is applying an equity lens because sometimes people in an organizations need more to be equitable. So that's uh, that always just got, got me thinking. Okay, and you know, I think the other thing that we, we need to do is to get um, more uh, it, I think nudge in a gentle way, nudge people to think um, more about the big picture. And what's exciting in health is that there's more of an emphasis of the social determinants of health. And that is the big picture. And so one of the ways this can be used to simplify the messy is to bring people together in your community to bring, you know, the, 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 um, the more diverse, you know, the, you know, I always used to say the better the mix, the better the fix. The, the more the fit, wait, I didn't say that right. The, be, the more the mix, the better the fix. 
And so when you bring diverse people together to look at these things like agriculture and, and food production and education and work and living and work conditions, when you bring people together, that is going to make the kind of community where people want to live, work and play and be healthier. So it's a great framework. The other framework that I'm using increasingly, and in part, this is because I'm the, the Canada chair of the of Catalyst 2030, which is a, a UN um, a related organi global organization that is looking at the 17 sustainable development goals. And this is a shared language. These, these 17 SDGs are a shared language for systems collaboration. Um, it's a simpler way to for communities to sit down and say, how are we doing? Like, how are we doing? And, you know, it's a way to celebrate the areas where you are being successful, but it's also a way to identify a, a starting point for what needs to be addressed in your community um, to, to address these global issues at a local level. We, we need to encourage localization of these issues. We're seeing more and more how we can't, we think they're global and therefore they don't impact rural Alberta. Well, trust me, they do. Uh, there's so many issues that are impacting us, but again, it's a, it's a good framework for helping us sort out the messy. So what is going to contribute to our individual community, environmental and economic well-being? It is in, in a nutshell, it's about better informed decision-making, innovation, community or stakeholder led development, strategic foresight, which is the piece I think we were all, a lot of us were missing. We didn't really look to the future as much as we should have. It's about cross-sectoral systems collaboration um, and the making the best use of our collective resources, regardless of what silo of funding they came from. That is the transformative leadership when we focus on these contributions. Um, the priorities for what's next, and we're not going to have a lot of time to, to talk about this, but I wanted you to know that in our, in of course, these are the kind of practical examples of what we're digging into, because this is what we are seeing through our research and our, and the promising practices of what is working. So it's, you know, spaces for people to come together, um, um, community events and celebrations, um, meaningful work, pride of place, opportunities for, I think, especially for youth, opportunities for how they can impact global issues like global warming. That's a way to get youth um, involved and engaged. So there's very practical things that can be done at the local level to address all of these issues that we've, that we've raised. And I know you're already aware of them. So here, here's the challenge really, and, and I, I sometimes feel like I should be handing out uh, the capes because so many of you are doing this already and deserve the cape. Um, but it's, it's about being courageous. It's about stepping forward. It's about not being entirely content with the present. And it's about being willing to invest energy in developing a better alternative. And we're not saying that everything has to change. We're seeing in a lot of cases, organizations and, and individuals and communities are probably doing 80% of the right things. So it's that other 20 that we wanna focus on. So it is about learning more about systems practice, systems thinking, learning more about strategic foresight, how do we engage and, and um, um, use a community-led development approach? But it's also increasingly about digital optimization and data science. So it, you know, and it's it. I that we've got another workshop in the works to really talk more about data science and artificial intelligence and machine learning and how we we can and should be using that. So that's what future readiness is about. Um, I've shared this before. I just think it's really powerful. And it's the kind of thing I have posted on my bulletin board. Hope that you will too. Um, I think it provides some really wise advice for how we deal with a time of, of turmoil. Um, and um, I think probably number five is one of the most important. And that's what I want to encourage you to do as well is to practice compassion compassion and kindness, not only for, for, our, for others, but for yourselves, to be kind and compassionate with yourself as well as others. And, you know, I, um, I think it's also about suspending judgment of others. I think that's part of being kind and compassionate. So um, I I'm, don't want to spend time on this, but just know that we have two courses coming up. 
Uh, one is called Positioning for the Future. It's cornerstones. And for those who are actually doing the work, you know, who, who have boots on the ground, there's a second course that really gets more into the, um, the hands-on. Um, and we're, we're you know, kind of the boots on the ground. And we're really happy that we figured out um, how to do collabinars. Um, how to deliver this learning in a way that allows for a lot more peer-to-peer -peer learning, as well as deeper, deeper and richer takeaways. So those courses are coming up. And in the slide deck, you'll have my contact information. So please don't hesitate to reach out. And I'm going to start, stop <laughs> sharing my screen and stop talking and let you um, uh, make any comments or ask any questions. And Anita and Holly, I understand that you're gonna help me with that. So I'll stop sharing. Thanks so much, Brenda. Um, so we do have a few minutes here before we hit the 11 o'clock mark. So I don't see any questions um, in the chat box or in the Q&A, but if any of you out there are good and courageous and want to put your videos on and ask a question live, that would be wonderful. Or even make a comment on some of the information that Brenda sh just shared with us. Oh, we have a question. Uh, Lorna, I see your hand is up. Not a question. I just wanted to thank Brenda. It's just been so good to hear your voice and to see your face. It's been a long time. And I certainly appreciate the energy and the knowledge you have of our province as you as you come back virtually for a visit to, to inspire us. So thank you for sharing. It's it's been great. Thank you, Lorna. I really, I really do appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks, Lorna. And you know what, Anita, I really what I really appreciated is that you allowed the silence. You allowed that space. Sometimes we have to do that. We have to just pause. <laughs> yeah, something I'm still learning to do, Brenda. Thanks. <laughs> Good job. So, Holly, did I miss anything here? I just want to make sure that if there was somebody else with a hand up. No, you didn't miss anything. I just had a comment for Brenda, too. Just a couple of the slides that I noticed in your presentation, Brenda, particularly around the messy work. I saw so many characteristics in your list that are directly connected to our committees that we work with. I saw a lot of those characteristics and I think a lot of the work they're doing is actually moving towards being ready for the future. So it's great. So just wanted to comment on that in case there was some community members in place today. Well, I, that's, I've got it. Thank you. Because, you know, wherever I go, I'm reinforcing your work as well as Art Hat, because you're one of the few organizations that's actually doing that. And I think, you know, I think it's a huge opportunity for health to take this leadership role and plant the flag for being those catalysts for collaboration. Um, so it, it you know, it's, it's gonna take some resources and some time, but, um, and some learning and sharing from the people who are doing the work, but I think it's a huge opportunity. I, I really do. And I think health is really well positioned to do it. So I, I love what you guys are doing. That's one of the reasons why I was excited when you asked me to come back and talk to you. So. <laughs> And there was another comment here, Brenda, from Mark. This was an amazing presentation, some very useful information, and timely for what is happening in our communities right now. Can't wait to watch this over again. Well, thank you. Now, that's an endorsement. I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, so with that, uh, once again, we want to thank you, Brenda. And I think what sticks out for me, at least, is also the comment getting good with messy because we know <laughs> in general is just totally unpredictable. Um, and also I really liked your analogy about the cookie. Like we promote the cookie in terms of what we do, but not so much the fortune, which are the benefits of what we do. Right. And so that just stuck with me. Um, and certainly the piece about our community, community builders being that secret sauce. I totally agree with that. Absolutely. Um, once again, I want to thank you, Brenda, and thanks to all of you for joining us today. It was a pleasure to host this session have an, and have a lovely rest of your day.